Welcome, Kyle Cunningham, to Home is Where the Dark is. How Thank are you very you? much. I'm glad to be here. It's uh, it's been a while since I've got to see you. Yeah. In person, so uh, this is uh, great, and I love the studio. It's kick Thank ass. Thank you. It's very you. It's uh, I just love. All, I mean, I'm like you. I'm like all black, even though I wore white today to kind of, you know. Offset stuff. It's a great contrast for the video. Thank awesome. you very much. Yeah, looks great. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I think what was the last time I saw you was a, uh, fuck. I think it was was it that party? Oh, I forgot the whose house we were at. Do you remember? I don't. I think it was that party. I, I was at it, um, shoot, was it? It was at Adrian's. I think it was at Adrian's. Oh yes. Yeah. When did I see Adrian? Oh, I saw him when we when Young Kevin played Bourbon Room two weeks ago. Um, on Holly in Hollywood, and uh, he came to the show, and I was like, "Yeah, it looks sick." He goes, "I'm so happy. I basically live in there now. I'm like, I'd be doing the same thing because that's that's what I'm. My plan is for my house in my backyard is to build a studio. So, do you have like a like a little casita out there, like a side actual Nothing side house? Yeah, okay. it's empty yard. I've got a swimming pool, but then next to it, I've got big enough land that I can build uh, 550 square feet. Wow! And so it, it'll be decent size, and I've got tons of drums, and so. You know, I just want it for me, basically, and just to, I can make all the noise I want. I, the first time when we did this, or we were, I was talking to contractors, they said I could go to 600 square feet because I live in a no HOA housing really? area. Yeah. So That's I was convenient. like, sweet, we can go nuts. But he's like, no, you can't go nuts. If it was 601 feet, then they got to do all this drilling and testing and all this kind of stuff. And it's a whole slew of permits to get. And every one of these contractors from what I wanted, they were like, oh, they'll, it'll be starting at like $78,000. And I'm like, what? It's like, I don't have that. You know, I was thinking like, like a baller place for like 40 or 50 max. Right. And I was starting at 78. And so I was like, okay, I can't do that. And so we started looking at the tough sheds. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 And I didn't think they made them that big, but this, they make the, like custom garages and they can build it to how I want. I just, I got a separate contract. I got to have an electrician guy. I got to have the soundproofing guy. Tough shed just drops it in there and go, there you go. Have fun. You know? Yeah. So, um, so it's a matter of just saving up money and getting it done. I was, it's, it was more than I thought it was going to be. It always is, right? It's yeah. like it always goes over budget, but yeah. it's worth it because, you know, it's it, your home. So then you can have even more of a reason to stay home. Right. <laughs> and I'm a new homeowner too. So I'm learning all this, all the fun stuff. I used to like, wow, I had it so lucky when I would just rent places and something breaks and I just make a phone call, fix this please, you know, and that's about it, yeah. you know, but now it's like, okay, this is a lot of money. So yeah. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's nice. I, I moved to Vegas, uh, me and my girlfriend moved to Vegas two years ago and, uh, love it, man. It's, uh, I don't miss this traffic one bit. I it's, bet. it's 25 minutes to get across town anywhere. That's, that's the general rule. Just 25 minutes anywhere you want to go. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So it's cool. And everyone's super nice. There's tons of LA people that are there. I call it LA part two. It's all of our touring buddies live out there. You know, it's like all the, the Gemini guys, uh, the five finger guys, uh, butcher babies, everybody's there, you know? So it's, yeah. and it's cool and you can live in a nice place and, and, and that's it. Yeah. I mean, you deal with the summer heat, of course, you know, but it's just, I mean, it's just the summer. It's hot here too. So right. It's like... Yeah. I was so mad when we came for that show and I was like, Okay, I can get, I get out of this 110 degree weather. It's going to be like, you know, 80 degrees here. No, it was like the same temperature. I was like, you got to be kidding me. So this year has been brutal heat yeah. wise here, just like unbelievable. Um, I'm really happy that it's the past couple of days it's been cooling down. But yeah, it's just been absolutely brutal. And wow. But so Vegas, man, yeah, that's cool. I mean, a lot of people I know as well have, have uh, you know, left LA to hit Vegas. And uh, I don't blame everyone because it's like the prices here are just insane just like to own a house here is is so expensive and even just to live normally to rent it's uh yeah it's terrible so yeah i've had my eye on vegas i've had my eye on like nashville so it's just like it's so tempting because i mean i could have a an awesome house there in either of those cities for what i'm paying here and just have room and space and not feel like i'm like crammed and absolutely like stressed out all the time with yeah. like the all the people but we'll come out come out and visit we got the guest room man. everyone yeah. like, literally when i moved there 
I've everyone comes to visit from here and maybe I'll get 24 hours of notice from my friends. You know, it's like, I'm in town. I'm like, here's, here's your house key. There's the room, you know? Rad. So, uh, that's yeah. sweet of you. Yeah, definitely. So come out anytime you want, man. Like, I feel like everyone has been out except you to see the house. So, yeah. So what's, uh, you had that show, which, uh, I saw photos of and my my buddy jordan said you guys sounded amazing and looked amazing so how was the experience it was fun it was very surprising uh we it was a last minute deal uh butterside had called my singer anthony and he has the show came up it was with uh the uh the booty burlesque girls and stuff and i, I think they had put it the show together i think it was they had Butterside, but they needed another band. And then uh, Butterside reached out to Anthony. Yeah, you guys, can Neon do it? And we all text each other. We're like, yeah, like, why not? We haven't played since Vampire's Ball at Globe Theater like a year and a half ago. And um, so it all worked out. I came in a day early, did rehearsal. Everything was fine. Everybody's pro. So it's just like if there's any kind of anything we need to change, it's just a phone call or a text. Everybody comes to rehearsal knowing it we usually just run through it once like it's that good and so we're like all right this is the easiest thing ever so um and it's not like we're a prog rock band it's not we're not doing different time signatures and shit like that you know it's but it's they're great songs but they're you know pretty basic four four yeah. you know kind of stuff um but uh we just sent out text to friends and stuff like that put out a post and it just so happened it was like the perfect storm of everyone here being in town it was a night where everyone wasn't playing or doing whatever and they could come. Yeah. And it, I thought we were probably going to bring like a hundred people, you know, and it jetted up to 300, like just wow. like that. And I was like, Oh, and I'd never played bourbon room before. And, uh, it's a great stage, great sound. Like the whole crew there is, is great. And, um, Hannah had, uh, done all the lighting for us and, uh, all the different, you know, the stuff on the LED screen she put together and made it look all totally rad. So we we're like, all right, this is awesome. And it it went off good. And I think it kind of kick started a little bit more more gigs for us because everybody's Great. like, hey, cool. So, you know, they want us back. You know, we want to do more LA shows, but then we've got a Vegas show that we're going to be doing with our friends in Crashing Wayward. And that's they're a Vegas band. Um, really cool, really good friends of ours. Uh, and that will be September 15th on a Friday out there. And it's, uh, at Vamped. I was just going to ask you if you've ever played there. Yep. I love that spot. Yeah, yeah. I've been there. Um, when I was in Mad Life, I'd, we'd done all the different tours and we were going through Vegas. We'd always play Vamped and it's, it's good sound, good stage. I yeah. mean, it's, it's got the, they still have the eighties lights, the cans, you know, that are like by the second song you're drenched cause it's so hot on the stage. But it's uh, it's cool. It's uh, it's a fun place. Staff is great, and they, and they make you sound awesome. Yeah, I went there many years ago. But it, there was a Doors cover band playing there, and it sounded great. And I really like the vibe of the club. But it's been such a long time. I'm sure it's it's revamped now. But uh. you know, you, I would I I want them so desperately to redo their light system. <laughs> I'm a big light guy. I Same. love lighting yeah. production. Yeah, I'm so big into that. And so uh, I was like, oh man, he just get rid of that and spend a little bit of money and, you know, just get some LED stuff and it'd be so sick in there. But it, it sounds great. Like that's what you mainly want is a good sound. And it, it still looks good. Um, I just get picky. You know? Dude, I'm, I think everything matters. If you want, like, there's so much that goes into the production of a show, as you know, and like all the little details matter. I mean, yeah. to me, I'd rather have a little bit less, a little bit more like subpar, um, audio sound and better lighting yeah. than no lighting and right. amazing sound. Because to me, lighting, like uh, lighting makes or breaks your live show. If oh, there's no lighting, agreed. it's just no matter how, I mean, I guess it depends on who you're, who you're watching, but if there's no lighting and you look and sound amazing, um, it's still, it's just, it's I a agree. little bit lackluster. Oh yeah. yeah. And I used to do this with uh mad life and cause I was in that band for, uh, nine, 10 years. Like when I, I moved to LA, I forgot what year it was, but I was there for 12 years, but I got the touring gig with them. I was only in LA for a month and we were gone on the bus for the whole summer. And, you know, we had good backing and good money behind us. And they were like, well, we're thinking about getting lights. And so 
I kind of did the deep dive into all that kind of stuff. It was a limited budget, but for what we got, you know, we still had movers, you know, and a bunch of parts. We could, everyone was lit up, but I was the king of getting everything synced up to every little detail. So, you know, it's one of those things, you know, when you see like, it could be the easiest drum fill in the world. I can just go dig it, dig it, dig it like this. But then when you got strobes doing right, like that, right. the crowd is like, <gasps> It's so much He's more amazing. Yeah, like, it's really. so much more like impactful for yes. sure. Yes. And I'm the king of that. And I already know what I'd want to do with this band for Neon Coven. Like, man, I just but it's like lights are so expensive, yeah. man. Yeah. And it's like, just give me fifty grand and I I'll make it a just stupid show, you know. Yeah. But so you're I, you're the DMX king. I am. I got, well, and I learned it almost by force because no one else wanted to do it. And I love lights, but I had to figure all the how all that programming works and how they talk to each other. Yeah, we went the, in the first few shows, the first tour actually. Um, we were out with when did we use that? I think we were with Wayne Static and we were doing opening and going on tour, which was the worst tour ever. Um, with Mad Life, yeah, Mad Life, uh, the Defiled uh, okay. from the UK, yeah. which I love that band, they're awesome guys. Um, and and Wayne, um, and Wayne was a sweetheart, it wasn't him at all it's just people that were surrounding him just not good people and um so but we had all the lights that we had it was all wired so i had a tower on each side of the drum kit we had two smaller towers on each side of the stage and i had we had built all the guys had built this stuff i just told them what i wanted and then the front was this board that had two lights out this way and another one it just shown up on the singer okay because phil we called him Angry Phil because um, he just looks pissed off all the time, but he's honestly a teddy bear. But he just he's just mad all the time, right? But he, he, I would show him how lights affect the uplighting. So I'd be like, dude, get in it the light when it lights up. So you'll just look evil the whole time. And he did, you know, and it, it worked out great. I just had to tell the guys because, you know, there's certain marks during songs where someone needs to be standing because that's where a light is going to sit. It might go pitch black over here and all of a sudden the guitar guy is going to be lit up. Yeah. But if he's like over here somewhere and everybody's just looking at a blank stage. So I had to teach him choreography. Right. It's you know? all, yeah, it's so important. Yeah. yeah. I told him, I was like, well, watch a Rammstein show. Oh, it's perfect completely example. choreographed. It's all synced. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, and everybody gets it when you say that. They're like, oh, okay. I know what you're saying, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. But it's good. I love light shows, man. Yeah. That w- I'd be doing that if I wasn't doing drums. And I probably will still get into it if I get when I get a little bit older. If I'm like, eh, I'd rather, you know, be the guy behind. I get it. You know, all yeah. the stuff. It'd be fun to do. So, are you? Do you have like a, a lighting synced up, uh, like a DMX system with Neon Coven, or we we don't have anything yet because uh, the band honestly it was kind of just a, a studio fun hobby project for yeah. us. Everyone's in different bands. You know, you got Ace and LA Guns. Jacob is producing everybody every week. Darren, he is the music coordinator for iHeartRadio. So he's doing everything for different stations all over the country. Anthony's Anthony. He's just the pirate that he's, I mean, he's in a couple of different bands. He's also, uh, which is funny to me, he's in the new face of Craftsman. He's on I those Craftsman yeah. commercials, right? And hilarious. now here's the coolest thing. And I'm, I think I can t- say this, but he's one of the pirates in one of the new uh, Star Wars films that's about to come out, the skeleton, nice. skeleton crew. And of course, me being a Star Wars nerd, we were like, tell me all about it, you know? Hell and yeah. It's so cool. So we're fired up for him. So everybody's, everyone's doing great, but great. to get us together, it's, you know, it's trying to herd cats, you know? Get it. So, yeah. um, but, you know, so there's no backing or anything like that, but that's kind of next on the list. I'd like to find that one guy that really loves us a lot and here's some money to help you out kind of thing. Yeah. Cause you need it, you know, and we, we don't want to do a, we could get a label deal if we wanted to, but it'd be the worst deal in the world, you know? And <laughs> yeah, I just, no one is interested in that. Could go down a rabbit hole with that, with that <sighs> whole topic there. With the yeah. record labels. But I mean, yeah. Uh, I started to dabble with DMX lighting and like syncing. Um, Cause I use pro tools the majority of the time, but for this podcast, I use Reaper. So I started experimenting with MIDI and DMX lighting with Reaper and, um, after doing a lot of research and, you know, experimenting, it seems totally doable. You just need like to get started. You need at least like five to 
10 grand just for something simple. Like yes. if you just have a few lights on stage, the laptop, the interface, cabling, yep. can get away with something um, for around that price, but it's not going to be extreme, like epic lighting like you see in most venues, but it's a start and then you can expand on it over time. But yeah, it is very expensive. It's more expensive than a lot of the music equipment we use up on stage. Easily like, by yeah, far. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. And I didn't realize that was a harsh reality for me. I thought I was going to just... because. Because I think I was given four grand for the Mad Life show. And, and I thought at first, I was like, this is going to be sick. I'm going to have, you know, eight movers. I'm going to have all this stuff. No. It's like one, it depends on what level of mover you want to, what yeah. company. Because I was looking at Elation, Chave, all this kind of stuff. You know, one mover from them can be 3,000 grand right. or five grand a piece. Right. And I was like, ooh. So it was a lot of slim pars. And I got away with the the uh, American DJ movers which in a small venue looks cool and if you're playing a big theater which some of the places we played were it kind of looked hilarious you know but <laughs> i had to i had to move the band in and that was kind of like a trick i learned from nine inch nails because they would play like a big stage sometimes but they would have they'd be all up front like the latest tour i just saw he was all up front literally they were in a line and they only had two guys behind him but they were in a straight line at the front of the stage. They took up half the stage. Like they would, they could easily play like a house of blues and still have a ton of room. But they were lighted up in certain in a way that it made the crowd focus in on you. You're not looking at washes and all whatever's going else around you. You're laser focused on the band, yeah. and that's how I did it with Mad Life. Well, I said we didn't have much, but even though we have a big stage plot or big stage, I would move us. In. smart and so that's yeah. what we do and lots of haze lots of haze oh yeah <laughs> dude it's so when it when you hit it right the amount of like a fog machine with the proper lighting synced up to the music it's just like there's nothing better man nothing see that kind of live show it's just oh, yeah. so epic like i remember when i saw um it's a bit extreme but um i don't know if you've seen mashuga live Oh. But their their lighting is like impeccably accurate, and it follows every like every, every little, kick drum, yes. every subdivision. It's just fuck. It's yeah. just so overwhelmingly epic. And it's funny you say that because I was watching a lighting production thing of theirs from what, two years ago, and it's it's mainly floor based. They had those long uh, little roll away tiers, but they had like one, two, three, four, five, six, like maybe seven lights on each one. But there's like eight across and there's three on the side and then you have some of the stuff you know but man yeah yeah it's, it's funny you mentioned that because i was just watching that and i was like i want that so bad just just four of those little things you know, know. <laughs> it's just just thinking about the different tiers of like budgets for certain bands productions live productions is just blows my mind because you see like you know, a band like Meshuggah, for example, like they have a lot of shit, but it's not as much as Rammstein. You go see right. Rammstein, it's like huge fucking million, like probably multi-million dollar productions sure. to get all their, their props, the lighting, the pyro, the fucking, it's just insane, man. Like how much money goes into these, these yeah. shows. And the, the programming, uh, for that too, uh, cause I, and I, that was another thing where I was kind of forced to learn because at first I was like, I need someone to do this for me. I know what I want it to look like. Cause when I, when I hear a song, I, I see colors already. I mean, not just for any, for any band, any music, I can close my eyes and I can picture what I want it to look like live. Um, but I was like, Oh yeah. And I was having issues cause I was trying to find the right programs. And I started with DMXs and I was going through that and I was running, we were running, uh, we did Pro Tools for a couple of tours, but it, it would freeze occasionally. And that's the worst thing in the world, especially, and Mad Life was uh, kind of heavy on the loops and, you know, that kind of thing. So when that stopped all of a sudden, it just, yep. it just sucked the room out, you know, like, oh my God. And so we moved to Ableton, never had any problems, but Ableton, I couldn't wrap my head around at the time. So I had a guy help me with that. Um but I programmed the show. He just was showing me how to drop it in yeah. and sync it up. So, um, yeah, but it's, uh, it's cool. But, oh man, but they make a lot of money for that programming stuff. When I asked, Oh, that'll be, you know, seven songs. That'll be three grand. Oh no, <laughs> I'll do it myself. You yeah. Know? So it's just YouTube, you know? Yeah. It's a, it's quite a learning curve, but I think like once you get the hang of it and the swing of how you like to program and what die you prefer to use, like, 
it just takes a lot of time to, to really get in the, uh, the nuances of the show and the light, like the specific type of strobes, the specific like color fading. Like there's so many different, you know, parts of it. So yeah, I think it's, it is a learning curve, but once you get the hang of it, you just, it just snowballs from there. So. And it's fun. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, how's it been? Um, so when we first met, I believe you were playing with Zane when I first met. Yeah, you. I was in uh, Society One, and we did some work together when you were in the dark. Yes. So are you are you still in touch with Brandon and those guys? I it, it's once in a while. Yeah, yeah. It's it's mainly Instagram. I, I I tell you what, this is the when they first moved to Berlin, I went out there to go visit them, uh, him and Caitlin. And um, I always call them my giraffes because they're both like, you know, six, five <laughs> and I'm five, seven. So it's like, you know, and they'd be walking in front of me. They look like giraffes just walking. Um, great people, great couple, everything, you know. And um, they took me around Berlin and showed me everything. Just super hospitable, you know. Um, and uh, and that was kind of it. You know, I, I visited and then came home and then but I always keep I follow them on Instagram and they're busy. They're doing good, yeah. you know, and, yeah. uh, you know, they, they got their, their band together. They got their look and the whole nine, you know, and so I'm, I'm happy for them. So, yeah. Good. Yeah. It's always, it's always awesome to see, you know, uh, all, you know, these different musicians and people that we, you know, we develop relationships with over time, whether it's through a project or through just the scene or whatever, it's cool to see, it's always cool to see when, when people like, they're on an upward trajectory and they, you know, getting more and more uh, successful with their music or whatever projects they're working on. It's really cool to see that. And, you know, people, the people that have that grit and uh, dedication to music, because yeah. there's also a lot of people I've, I've met that they, they have like their moment and then for whatever reason they just stop. Right. And that that's it for like, they, they go into like finance or something, you know, right. whatever. So it's, it's always cool to see, you know, the people that really have that X factor and that drive, like continue to push forward, even if maybe they switch projects or they change lanes in whatever way, but. Or move yeah. to a different country. Or move to, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That had to be yeah. hard. And I'll give it to them. They, uh, obviously they reinvest in themselves. And cause I remember he got that crazy board, uh, that, um, uh, oh my God, why am I skipping on his name? Slate Raven. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I saw that. I was like, woo, okay, cool, you know? And so, and they've been busy going at it, but it's good. I mean, you, and you have to do that now. If you're not, if you're on your own, you got to reinvest in yourself always. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy for them. It's good. Yeah, it's cool that you guys have stayed in touch. Like, um, I'll, you know, message people here, here and there. But um, yeah, I mean, I haven't really, I think I had, I had Sonny on many, many, uh, many years ago when we, when I first started, but I never yeah. got to meet Sonny. I no. know, I know who he is. Yeah. I just, I didn't get to meet him at all, but yeah. Yeah. So you also have played shows with Yarky 69. Yes. So tell me a little bit about your experience. Um, I know you, you did a bunch of shows with him and like, uh, getting to play those classic 69 I songs and stuff like how, how was that experience for you? It was amazing. Yeah. It was, and how it came to be was so strange. He, uh, I was hanging out at Viper Room and I would gotten a DM on my Instagram from him and he was it's like, hey, and it was just very direct, you know, and, you know, Yerky being Yerky, he's just, you want to, you want to do this tour, two week tour, you know, I'm coming to the United States. But I was like, yeah. And so, and then um, we were actually going to try to get Tommy to do the tour, to do the run as well. And he couldn't. And, uh. But I mean, it worked out perfect with Ace and Ashes. I mean, it was just great. I mean, it was, and it was so fast. And um, he was—he sent me all the songs that he wanted to do, and uh, everyone learned it. And it was—I think we had. Did we do maybe? Two, I think we. It was quick, like maybe two rehearsals, and then we were gone. Wow. And uh, Mark was out. MGT was out with us, and and I didn't know him which I felt stupid after I Googled him. I was like, oh my God, this guy's played with everybody. Like everyone I love, this guy's like, you know, he's done it, you know? And so, um, and that whole crew was super nice as well. Um, and we just went out, hit all the clubs. Uh, Yerky's great. We would, uh, <laughs> he's one of those guys, he talks. I mean, he, he will talk 
all day, all night. And he, he, you know, he's like one big like historian, basically, you know. And, you know, he's got that. I just feel like they all have that low voice. I've, I've met all, I've hung out with all the 69 Eyes guys multiple times, right? They all have that low voice. And when we talk like, Those we fins. talk like, yeah. This. yeah. And, you know, and <laughs> when I come to the United States, so I, we would drink alcohol, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's great. Uh, but he's, yeah, it's a nice guy. He's, he's a true rocker guy. There's no, he is who he is. Like how you see him, that's how he looks every single day. You know, that is, it's the shades, the leather, everything. I mean, he's, it's not like, well, let me take off my stage outfit, you know, and do whatever like that. He's to the core who he is. All those guys are. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and getting to play that, the funnest show was the whiskey show. I was there. I loved it. That was, it was awesome. Amazing. And it was uh, the best show. And you got to meet so many other people too. Like, you know, uh, um, got to meet Clem Burt from Blondie's drummer, oh, shit. which was awesome, you know? And, uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was just great. It was a lot of fun. It was, and it was easy because everyone came prepared. Everyone knew the stuff and it was just simple. You just, it's like, oh, okay. Does anyone got any questions? Nope. All right. Let's go. And that was it. And so wow. I just, uh, and Ashes hit me up the other day and he was just like, man, ready for another Yerky tour. I'm like, me too, man. So it's, and we talk all the time. Yerky will hit us up just to message, say, hey, and, and all that kind of stuff. But he's a very, very good guy, very loving person. So it's, uh, it's nice. So I'm, I'm ready anytime he wants to go out again. Yeah. I can't wait. I hope that happens again. Me too. Yeah. Very for sure. Soon. Cause I know he's so busy with, you know, 69 eyes and he has his soul stuff. He's probably has a bunch of other projects he's doing, but yeah, it's cool to see that he's, he's stayed so active for so many years. 69 eyes has been around for many, like over 30 years, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I th- think it's, I think it's all original band too. I think they're one of those few bands that are all original. Maybe they I think had you're right. Like, yeah. But yeah. And they're constant, you know, they have, to me, it's still old school. You know, they record the record and they tour that record for a year. They're off for like a month and then record again and then back out again. It's just the steady machine. So it's good. And they're all just cool guys. And I, it's so funny about this. This is, this is my space days. Okay. I wasn't even living in LA yet. I was living in San Antonio, Texas. And, uh, do you remember the, the MySpace girl forbidden? Yeah. Okay. So she was all about that band. Right. And I was like, you know, she posted the videos on her MySpace page and I loved UC because he's just, he's fun to watch. He's very animated yeah. and we're kind of the same and that kind of thing. He looks cool. And, uh, I was like fast forward to like a couple of months and it was January. I went to the NAMM show and one of my friends, uh, my friend Bones from Julian K, he took me to the rainbow. I'd never been there before. And I'm, we're sitting down having dinner and then there walks forbidden. Right. And I was like, and I'd never been to LA, you know? So I'm like, Holy shit, there's forbidden. And then there's UC. I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> like they're from Helsinki. What are they doing here? So then we wind up hanging with them and then, 30 minutes later, I have UC sitting in my lap in a car. All the other 69 guys were packed in and we're going to some model's house in the Hollywood mm. Hills, <laughs> going to a party. And it's just like, you couldn't write this. This is just, I never would have expected this to happen, you know? And it's yeah. just, it's very one of those Hollywood situations that happens to you, you know? You're like, I can't believe this is going on. So. I think a lot of Hollywood situations start at the rainbow. <laughs> yes, very much so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've had many fun rainbow nights. Oh and, yes, uh, you never know who. That's 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 one of the magical things about LA is like is as if you just put yourself out there, you never know what could happen. That doesn't you're not guaranteed something will happen. But right. if you're just in the right place at the right time, very true. And it's a small circle. No, people think LA is so big. It's not. You know, it's like I, I would. I think when I first moved into town is where I would run into people, famous celebrities, just on accident, like going to the CVS or Rite Aid. I used yeah. to live right off. I used to live on Martell where the Rock and Roll Ralphs is. Martell was like one street over. So I lived there and so I could be in the thick of everything. And and that's, I would just see all the celebrities. Like, like I said, it was like, be at Rite Aid. And then one night, I uh, literally bumped into Lawrence Fishburne, right? And wow. I, I, we bumped each other and the first word I was like, Morpheus, <laughs> you know? And he's like, how's it going, you know? And then, probably the biggest guy or celebrity I ever met was uh, Brad Pitt. And he was, and I didn't know it was him at all, but it was like one of those things where 
he we had parked at the same time. He was already walking ahead of me, and we were in you know in L.A. There's a lot of people that look like famous people. Yeah, you know, you got the lookalikes and stuff that show up to parties in L.A. and stuff. Um, so I'm seeing him from the back. I'm like, oh, that guy kind of looks like Brad Pitt, right? But I didn't see his face just yet. And uh, so we go to the. He's going to the pharmacy. I'm going to the pharmacy. And we're waiting in line. And I just see everybody in that line just go. <laughs> <laughs> like looking. I'm like, oh, shit, that's him, you know. And I so desperately want to take my phone out and be like, eh, you know. But I just didn't do it. So it's, It surprises me to, to know that celebrities of that, like like A-list celebrities like that, will, will go out just to CVS by themselves. Like that blows my mind. Because, I mean, I get I get it. You, you want to feel like a normal person like everyone else and be able to go do whatever you need to do to take care of business. But it's like, holy shit, you know, that's yeah. brave. And the, the thing about Mad Life was, um, so the guitar player uh, and the singers, the guitarist owned this electrician company and still does to this day. Uh, but he was an electrician to the stars, basically. So when I first joined the band, they would come, I you know, we had a 24-hour lockout, you know, it was just, we had the biggest room, everything out in the, at Soundcheck Studios. Yeah, and um, so I'd get there first, and they come in from work. And I was like, "I was doing. Oh, we're at Madonna's house today, and we were. Or we went to uh, Seth Green's house, like Family Guy's, you know, plays today. We're doing electric for that, and they just did uh, Jay Z and Beyonce's place. They did you know, all this stuff, right? So I got to hear all the stories about you know meeting them. They're just regular people they just yeah. don't want you to fan out when you right see them everybody's just like just be cool you know yeah um and that's it but yeah that was kind of how it all started so i got fun stories about that the, the one the best one was the seth greenhouse because uh he had you know in iron man how he had jarvis and talk like he opens the door and like oh hello you know uh, talking to Robert Downey Jr. And I didn't watch any of those movies. Okay, well, so he's got the house is basically automated. So when Robert Downey walks in, there's this voice, oh, welcome home, sir, blah, 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 this kind of thing. Well, Seth Green did the exact same thing, except he got uh, uh, Richard, but the, the guy from Star Trek, the bald guy from okay. Star Trek, because he had done so many Family Guy voiceovers and stuff like that. So when you walk in the door and all that stuff, he's like, hello, Seth. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and I was like, that's just bad. That's just money just to have fun, you know? So, that's awesome. Yeah. Hell yeah. So it was cool. But yeah, I'm, I'm thankful for the, the Mad Life ride. That was, that was a lot of fun. How many years was that? Well, I was in it for nine or I think nine years. There was a drummer before me. Um, he was in that band for a couple of years, and then he was also a tech. And so he had gotten the Def Leppard gig, and he was Rick Allen's tech. And then he was then he moved on to uh, NXS when they did the the TV show, and they found their singer guy and went out and stuff. But he's kind of one of those. He's like one of those first call guys for techs, you uh -huh. know. And so he he's like, well, I'm gone for the next two years, you know. And Matt Life is like, well, we need a drummer. So that was that's how I came into play. Right on. And that was it. But yeah, I came to LA through uh through Bones, um, who was in Julian K, uh Ryan and Amir from Orgy, those guys. And my buddy Patrick Kennison, um, who plays in Lita Ford, and um my old roommate John Younger. Um, we were all San Antonio boys and they left to go out to LA before I did. And you know, those first couple of years, everybody starves, you know, you, you yep. <laughs> until you find yourself, you yep. know, and you're scraping pennies together. And I was doing, I, I've been a cover band since I was a cover band kid ever since I was, you know, young, you know, because it was, if you were in the right band, it was really good money. Mm -hmm. And I just happened to be in the top band in San Antonio doing the college circuit. I just did the whole Texas circuit, everywhere in Texas. So you play four nights a week, three sets a night. You were, know, you, were you born in Texas? Born in Austin, Texas, okay. but I moved around a lot too. So I went from Austin, Texas to Carlsbad, New Mexico to Brandon, Mississippi. Okay. Uh, from Brandon, Mississippi, I was like from sixth grade till the time I was 20, I lived in Mississippi. And then I moved out and I moved to Memphis, Tennessee, and then lived there for five years. Wound up back in Austin with a band that we all hated each other by the time we got there. Uh -oh. <laughs> and I didn't like Austin uh, either at that time. 
uh, if you didn't sound like Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble, they didn't want to hear it. And mm-hmm. I was not about that. And I love Stevie Ray Vaughan, but it made me hate that music because everyone played it, you know. And so uh, I was very broke at the time. I was playing in a couple of different original bands, doing nothing. And we were rehearsing at this place called The Ark. And that name is famous because there was a band called The Ark Angels back in the day. Um, you got the Double Trouble guys that are in it. You had... I think it was Charlie Sexton or Will Sexton. I was one of those two. Anyway, everybody's got name, huge names, right, in that Texas scene. Um, so I was there rehearsing with the band, and I made friends with the owners. The owner broke up the rehearsal that I was in with the band, just walked in and said, come outside, I need to talk to you. And he said, hey, there's this band down the hall auditioning drummers. It's a cover band, you know, but they make really good money. You should go audition. And... So I walked down the hall, introduced myself. You know, they gave me a CD of three songs to learn. I came back the next day, got the gig. Nice. And that was it. And that's what started it off. So everyone lived in San Antonio. When I moved down there, that was the start of like Union Underground. Patrick was that started that band and met all those guys first. And it was just, you just hit the ground running. It was four nights a week, just touring all around Texas. And it's great money. And, um, and those guys, Bones and my roommate at the time, John Younger, they moved to L.A. because to join DJ Ashba because he okay. had just left Beautiful Creatures to do his own solo thing. And I don't know how they all connected, um, but they were like, we're going, you know, like that's, you know, he's got some, you know, money behind him, all this kind of stuff, support behind him and everything. So they went out there and, you know didn't do, really do anything but it got them where they wanted to go and where they needed to be uh bones moved on to the julian k gig and then i got getting calls just move out to la man it's like they need drummers out here desperately like there's just not enough it's like you've got plenty of guitarists bassists but every drummer here in la is like they ha- they're in six bands right <laughs> well good drummers are yeah, yeah. good drummers yeah <laughs> and so i was like i was finally sick of playing cover songs i was just over it and so i was like ah screw it fine moved out there and bones was he was basically his own network he knew everybody in la so he would just introduce me to everyone so i owe a lot to him oh and here's the crazy thing two nights before i moved out there we were doing our my last show uh second to last show in dallas i was gonna do my farewell show in san antonio and the band we had own van and trailer our own PA lights, like you pre everything. Played our show in Dallas, stand in a nice hotel, wake up the next day, everything's gone. And van, trailer, stolen, all my equipment, new drums, gone. And uh, they found the van, never found anything else. What? Yeah. Holy shit. And so I didn't even get to play my farewell show. I called Bones. I was crying because I was just like, they took everything. I'm like, that's like my baby, you know? Whoa. And, um, and I was freaking out. And he was calm as calm. He's like, just come out here, you know? And I was like, because I had sold my truck. I was just going to fly out there and have all my stuff, you know, transported out yeah. there. And um, I was like, you don't understand. I don't have anything. Like, I don't even have sticks. And he's like, just come out. You're, you're good. And, um, and I had a Mapex kit at the time. And I had a couple of endorsements. I had a simple endorsement, stick endorsement. So I could call my reps and tell them what happened. They would send me some stuff, but no drums. And uh, so I get there to L.A., and Bones had the exact replica of the kit that was stolen from me. Same wow. color, everything ready for me to go. And he's like, you take this, and when you get your own kit, you know, give me my shit back. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. That's awesome. Dude, oh, yeah. he was amazing to me. And... um just a really good guy. Anyhow, who does that, you know? And so um, I was there with him. He picked me up, and I went straight to rehearsals with them because they were getting ready to do the Project Revolution tour with Linkin Park. Nice. And so they had a huge production. They were um, – I forgot. It was some L.A. guy that uh, – he was some billionaire guy that uh, started his own rock label for certain bands and stuff. And Julian Kay was like his star baby, you know? And um, because he was a big orgy fan. And so they had crazy money behind it. You know, they had the buses, the crazy production, everything. So I was sitting there just watching him rehearse and Chester would come in and you get to hang out with him. Like, 
this is my first week here, you know? And then, uh, uh, he was like, Oh, I'm, I'm playing. I got to go sit in and play at the Roxy and go sit in with this, uh, this cover band. And, you know, do you want to go? Yeah, of course I want to go with you, you know? And so never been to the Roxy before, you know, go there. And, uh, you know, the, the cover band is like Dave Navarro, Matt Sorum, the guy from the Sex Pistols. It, it's it's everybody, right? And then, you know, backstage at the Roxy is upstairs, right? And yep. so walking up the stairs and there's Steve Stevens and Josie. You know, I'm walking up the stairs, I see him first. And I'm like, that, that's that's Steve Stevens, you know? And, and then walk up right behind him, there's Dave Navarro, you know? Then there's Tommy Lee. Then there's Gavin Sex Pistols. And I'm like... And I'm wanting to take my phone out and just go <laughs> take a picture, buddy. And, and he like grabs my hand. He's like, no, no, no. Just just yeah. enjoy this. And just chill out. And I'm like, is it like this every night in L.A.? <laughs> and they're like, they're laughing. They're like, no, it is not like this every night. But it was cool. It was a, And I felt bad because when I would call my friends back home, I'm like, well, this sounds like a complete fabrication because of everyone that I just met within a 10-minute span, you know. But um, it was it was cool. And then a month later... Got the Mad Life gig on the bus out for the summer, and it was it was great. But then I was thinking, oh, this is easy. I just came here, and I, I've already made it, you know, kind of thing. And I came, we came home, and then there was just nothing going on. So it was just the, the starvation part of it came in for a little while. But then, you know, things happened. I started jumping into, like, the five or six bands. I was playing with everybody that I could just to get my name around yeah. the city. And um, and it worked out, and it was good. And then I uh, later on got the Fast Times gig, which the '80s cover band, and everybody's all dressed up, but they've been around for forever. And um, it was you know one of those things, kind of like a Steel Panther gig. You know, it's it's a good living. You know, you're you know you're playing all the time, and uh, it's cool. I got sick of wearing that Devo helmet, though, man. I was, <laughs> oof, Lord. So you really hit the ground running there. That's awesome. uh, yeah, I did for sure. You know, it's. You always wish, well, like, ah, I wish more would happen, or I wish I would have done this, or that kind of thing. But, you know, you never know. Yeah. But it's at least, it's something that I can say that was, it's been steady for me. And LA treated me pretty nice. And then I was, uh, I don't know, it was just the last few years before, the, even when the pandemic hit, maybe before it, it was just kind of, you know, like, you know, being there for 12 years, the scene was pretty popping when I came here. Mm hmm. And a lot of the bands that we saw that that were kind of coming up that were going to be next, you know, they, yeah. oh, okay, they're going to be up next. And so you saw that happen, but then it just, each year, it just kind of started fading away a little, you know, bit by bit. And then it started, the scene was kind of a little dead, you know, or at least the scene that I like to go to. I can't say for every, speak on everything, but, uh, you know, the stuff that I like, the bands that I like, it nothing happened. And then pandemic happened and then everything was closed and a lot of people didn't recover from it yeah uh so and then all my friends that are on tour now like i ask them how it's how they're even making it right now because one of my friends was telling me just tour bus prices Ugh. it was like you know it used to be like you're out for a month it's going to be 25 30 grand you know and then you it's 150 for your driver you know that kind of thing and they've doubled it you know it's like 60 grand for just the bus you're you know you haven't even paid for the driver or gasoline right, yet. Right. Um, so it's, uh, it's hard. Out what there. do you think when you, when you said that, um, that you noticed like kind of a gradual decline and then the pandemic hit, I mean, I feel like everyone, well, I definitely noticed that. What do you think that, why do you think the reason for that was like, what do you think the, why do you think that happened? I, I honestly don't know. I'm not sure. It, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It it was just a weird kind of thing. It wasn't like a all of a sudden everything was just gone. It was just like a little piece here, a little piece here, a little piece, you know, each yeah. year. It just – it wasn't as exciting. It wasn't as much – there weren't as, wasn't as much music, I would say, or the shows that you wanted to go see that was really happening or people wanting to go out. There's a certain atmosphere that L.A. has when this city is like, like truly alive, when it's really going off. Man, you can just feel it, you know? Mm -hmm. And – I wouldn't feel it anymore. It's just like, eh, okay, not, not really. But I, I wish I had a good answer for that, but I don't. Um, but yeah, it just wasn't there. And I just, when, I tell you what, the, 
what started for me where I was like, ooh, here's the beginning of the end is when uh, they tore down the House of Blues. Mm. And Mm -hmm. I played there countless times. And one of the bands I played in, we did a residency with Steel Panther with them for a month straight. And I mean, that wasn't like, it's packed. Every time you play, like on a, what, Monday or Tuesday night. It was some, you know, yeah, off night. I it's remember those nights. Packed. Yeah. Every celebrity is there, you know, they're making fun of them. And it was amazing. Like that kind of thing. And I, that's not there here anymore. It's like a hotel now or something. Yeah, well, it's yeah. going to be. And then they just bought that whole section where Viper Room is. And they've already closed down the, the, uh, that little, uh, liquor store Mm -hmm. uh, place next door and that's sad because that's been there for so long i mean i think it's whoever's doing the hotel whatever i think it they're going to keep like a a viper room ish kind of thing like when you walk in maybe it'll probably be like a tiny hole in the wall and maybe still have the green logo or something like that but it's not going to be viper room. yeah yeah, it's too bad. I think a lot of it, what had to do with, at least from my opinion and from my observation is I think the whole, I think streaming really fucked up the music industry in my personal opinion. Easily. Like, I really do. And it, obviously I think every year it seems like bands have, uh, bands budgets go down lower and lower and it's like have less money. Cause especially here in LA, like California inflation has been insane. Yep. And, um, just from my experience, like as a producer in, in the music industry, like every year, Every year, it seems like bands have less and less money to make music and to do their thing. I mean, unless you're on, unless you're like on a major label, you know, you're in that top one percent tier. It's different, of course, but like the average musician that wants to make a decent living from music, it just seems like every year there's less and less budget and less and less to work with. And I think the whole streaming thing really fucked us, in Easily. my opinion. And that came out. What was Napster two thousand? Well, or was it in the 1990s? I believe it was 2000. Yeah, I think it's around 2000 ish. So let's just say, yeah, let's just say 2000. So 23 years ago. And that changed, that changed the music forever. No one made any money after that. And then the labels, they ate each other because they started buying each other out. And then your mid level, mid tier level artists that could play a 3000 seater. They could, you know, back in the day, you could release, they could release an album and tour behind it and come home and they didn't have to work or have like a nine to five job. And, you know, they could st- and write music and still go back out and make a decent living for themselves. Not, not like millions and millions, but they can make a living and right. not have to do another, have another s- separate income coming in. And after that streaming came in, that was it. Well, I think, yeah, obviously Napster was a huge hit to the industry, but then Nap- it was like the downloads is what started, like the, the digital downloads and the torrents. And then there was like iTunes. But then when Spotify, I can't remember what year Spotify launched, but then it went from downloads, like iTunes downloads to streaming. And that shifted everything because even with people like, okay, I have to spend nine ninety nine cents to own this song forever and I just keep playing the same file and then at least the band got like I don't know uh ten cents of that or something right Point but zero, now zero, 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 one cent <laughs> right well no even 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 because I, I remember the numbers when I when I used to have um when I had a CD CD baby account now I have a distro kid but in CD baby it would show like per every 99 cent download you get like 10 cents or something like that right depending yep. on what plan you have but um now it's like most people don't even download anymore. It's just streaming and you get like fractions of a penny. Yep. And then it's just, I don't, I don't see how, I don't see how bands survive. Like I, I don't, I don't see how it's feasible as uh, I think most, most bands like, <laughs> this is another thing that will piss a lot of people off, but I think a lot of bands like to put up, put up the image online that oh, they are. Course they are successful solely from their band or from their music. But 99.9% of these people have day jobs, which I don't, there's nothing sure. wrong with that at all in my opinion. Right. But I think a lot of, a lot of people want to put the image out there that like they're, they're, they're making so much money and they're doing so great, which I don't know. It's just, it's really fucked up. Right. It, it reminds me of like, it uh, reminds me of hip hop artists. You know, you yeah. see all on the videos, they've got the, the chains driving the Bugatti. I'm like, his chains aren't real. That Bugatti's rented. That. rented yeah. You know, it, it's yeah. it's that. But yeah, it's it's the fake it till you make it kind of thing. So and and that's the world we live in as far as Instagram, TikToks, and stuff like that. You only see people's 
good best side and the best filter to make you look good and everything. So, I mean, that's the world we live in right now. Yep. And then I, I kind of, I kind of smirk about the, the SAG thing that's going on. So here in LA, we, you know, everybody's on strike that work in the film industry. Yep. And I just remember seeing the interview of like the Netflix and Disney channel, like they're doing all this streaming and they're not sharing any of this. We're not getting any money from it. And like, as a musician, I'm like, are, are you new familiar. to this? <laughs> yeah. yeah. This has been happening to us for 23 years now. Yeah. So like, welcome to our life. Yeah. You know? It's, uh, so, it's, it's, it's fucking scary though. Like what the direction that, um, entertainment industry in general is going in just with, um, with AI and all this shit. It's like, it's pretty terrifying in my opinion, but I mean, what can it's, you do really? Yeah. You know, you got another, like you got to adapt to survive, I guess. You but, do. Yeah. I totally understand why writers and actors are on strike because if I was an actor and, uh, these companies wanted to, you know, hire me for one session to scan my whole body and, and, uh, and capture it digitally so that they can reproduce me in any movie in the future and to per perpetuity yes, with, with AI and yeah. not pay you yes. like fuck that. Yeah. I would, I would be right up in the, on those strikes with them. Man. Oh yeah, like, totally. Yeah. And they and especially the writers, you know, and I, I'm willing to bet that's what's going on now in, in the music industry. I haven't, I need to ask Jacob about that. He would know. Cause you know, that's what he does for all these people. He's a writer, producer and stuff, but I'm, willing to bet that's next on the chopping it, It's block. happened already. Like, yeah. that's why there, you know, there was that Drake track where it was all, all yes. AI. It's happening. Even um, the inflections in his voice, it yeah. was like dead on. I was like, that's frightening. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm still, I'm still very, uh, it's, I mean, obviously it's AI is in its infancy, but it's going to get so much better so, so quickly. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's something we we won't be able to ignore in the very near future. <laughs> this is our therapy session yeah. right now. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of therapy, um, this is the theme question of the podcast. Which, since you said you listened to it, I think you know what it's going to be. Uh, what was one of the darkest moments in your career, and what did you do to overcome it? Darkest moment in my career. Um, okay. Um, there's been a few, <laughs> um, and I, I've gotten lucky because I had help. Um, so you know, like the first one being everything getting stolen, you know, that just, man, that's a killer, right? I don't have kids, but I felt like someone just took my kid away, you know, but, yeah. you know, through a good friend that was there, that was when I was down at the, my worst, you know, mentally too, cause freaking out, but it, it happened so fast in a way that it was, everything was kind of better within couple of weeks that kind of thing um that was one but it's because i had someone there that was really helping me and uh another bad one um that we should have done something about that we didn't uh was when i said my worst tour ever was the wayne static tour um that was bad we shouldn't even have left uh they had a horrible person as a tour manager, like some stripper as a tour manager hired by Wayne's wife, uh, and just just an evil person. Like you don't even want this person. You know, all it takes is one person to ruin a tour to yeah. make it not fun. Yeah, and you're stuck on a bus with them. You know, uh, it's bad. And we should have left, and we didn't only because. All the bands were, everybody in the band was cool and we loved it. Like Ashes was, was in the band um, um, at that time and uh, all the Defiled guys and they came all the way from the UK and I loved that band. So I was like, ah, so still, I like hanging with everybody, but all this other crap that has to come along with it just to play your gig, you know, you know, you're on stage for 35, 40 minutes, you know, but it's the other 23 hours that you're just in hell so um that was one thing that i wish we just would have left and gotten off that tour but um that took a while just to kind of get over wow uh mentally about it because i'm i was still mad i was just mad all the time you know and i'm if you talk to me when i'm a band i'm always the happiest person you know because yeah. like dr drummers will always be the happiest person in any band because we get to beat the crap out of stuff and it's very yeah, you've had your therapy session yes it's very cathartic <laughs> you know it's like if you're pissed off hit drums you're happy yeah. hit drums you know yeah. so it's it's a good thing but um yeah it's uh, you know it, it's that it's um i i think 
uh, for me and probably other musicians too, um, it's, it's a, a mental battle that you play with yourself. Um, like for instance, all my friends that I see right now that are out on tours, you know, they're playing, you know, big, like I, my friends in, you know, Butcher Babies, my friends in Cold Chamber, like we toured with Cold Chamber and all that kind of stuff. And I, I see them running, they're out right now and they're playing for just thousands, thousands. And I'm super happy for them because those are my friends. Um, but at the same time, I'm like, God, I don't want to be out there doing that because it's like killing me, you know. Um, so it, it can become a mental struggle for you, you know. And so if you let yourself beat yourself up and you start going down that hole, you know, you got to be careful and not. So is it like a, like a FOMO thing? Yeah. You know, or Or, or just like, I've just, I've been doing it all my life. And then all the things that we've discussed now, just the music business is in the toilet and it has been for a while. So it's, it's hard to, you know, you know, are you going to make money doing this? Are you going to be able to pay your bills? You know, this kind of deal. And you're getting older, you know, this kind of thing. So clock's ticking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I feel like it's a race against time, Yep. you know, to get all this. And, and it's not just music that I want. To, I still feel like I haven't accomplished my greatest musical achievement yet. I feel like it's still out there, which is awesome. Like it gives me something to look forward to. And I'm in a band of badasses. Like it's, I've been in so many bands and this is like the best one I've ever been in because everyone is so talented that it, it makes you up your game. You got to keep up yep. in this because they're fast. Like if you don't have your idea ready, someone else in that band is going to write it for you. You know, that's the best situation to possibly be in, in my opinion, in, in a band, in your career in general, just surrounding yourself with people who are the same level or better than you. It only makes you better so much faster than if you're in a group of people that, you know, if, if you're the smart, like if you're the smartest person in the room, like you're not going to learn that much. Right? right. So that's the type of thing. So I, I totally, I totally agree with you there. And, um, I think most people struggle with, uh, you know, I wouldn't call it, I wouldn't say it's jealousy, but when, you know, you see your peers out on tour and you're not, and you're at home, yeah. it's just, it's, it's their time and it's not yours. And you're sitting there like really just not jealous, but you're just like, fuck, well, I, what do I need to do to like make this happen? So I think most people feel the same exact way. I definitely go through that too. Um, I also, I don't know if you struggle with imposter syndrome, but that's a big one for me too. Yeah. So I think that kind of goes in, into the same kind of realm there. Um, another thing like that when you mentioned Cold Chamber, because I think it's just their time now because they were, they were disbanded for so long and yeah. now they're finally re-blooming so it's just it's their time to thrive man i've been following them for so long so, we did a, yeah. a summer tour with them uh it was us uh cold chamber and fear factory and that was an amazing tour that was the whole summer sounds awesome oh my god and like i didn't know any of those uh, i knew uh meigs and i knew mikey oh well, i knew nadia too i didn't know des um but i didn't know any of the fear factory guys um but we all became you know, like you're on a tour together and all that kind of stuff. You become a family, you know, so you're all traveling together. Um, but it was cool. And Burton would come out. We're, you know, obviously the opening band, but Burton loved one of our songs. So he would like first night of the tour, he goes like, hey, can I come out and like sing the chorus on that one song? We're like, hell yeah, man, whatever you want to do. Nice. And uh, Burton was the greatest, man. He was super cool, but everyone was nice. And it was a, it was a good tour. We had the perfect crew, like it was just a breeze, you know? And so I, I love that. And it's like, that thing was like, well, I've already done this. I've already done it before. I've played in front of big crowds, all that kind of stuff. And like, I should be doing it again, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, but, uh, yeah, it will happen again. Yeah, for sure. It will. Yeah. I know it. Yeah. But yeah, we, you know, our careers, are, it goes through ups and downs, it's waves. Like that's one of the, I think for me, one of the hardest things to just, to get used to is that, it's, uh, you know, just going through the ups and downs, like there's times when you're doing really well and like amazing things are happening and dreams are coming true. And then when all of a sudden it stops for, you know, you never know how long, maybe a month goes by when shit, nothing's happening or six months or a year. It just depends on, you know, your situation. But if you can get through those down times and not get too in your head and not beat yourself up about it and right. survive through those times, then you're good. But it's, it's extremely challenging because you're, 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 you're just constantly doubting yourself. You know, you're just going like, well, it must be my fault. 
Like I, I'm, I suck. I, I, Wait, I got, I got anymore? this. I got this far, and I did. I, I reached all these goals, and I did all these awesome things. I never thought I would, but since they're not continuing to happen, yeah, then uh, I'm failing, I guess. But I, I totally, I totally resonate, man. Yeah, <laughs> good. I'm yeah. glad it's not just me. Yeah, no, <laughs> I'm sure everybody, everybody goes through that. But well, shit, man. Before we wrap it up, is there anything you'd like to plug for the listeners? Okay, so. Um, Neon Coven is, uh, we're going to be playing in Vegas and that will be at Vamped September 15th. We've actually got a lot of LA people that are going to come out f- for that too. Like we've got some, uh, some good friends and fans that want to come out to do it. So I think Sweet. we're going to really pack it out. And, uh, I think this last bourbon room show was kind of like a, a show all tell all to us that was like, Oh, okay. We've got more people than we realize that really like this band. Um, it's just a matter of getting out there and doing it. But we'll be back in L.A. playing more shows. I already know it because it's just as soon as that happened, you could kind of feel it between everybody like, OK, all right, let's really dedicate more time to this, you know, and um, and people want to see us. And so that's uh, that's the best thing about it. And that's great. And then I'm also doing uh, drum tracks uh, for people uh, in Vegas from my house out there. So uh, I've been. Over the pandemic, I learned logic, which you know, because I was like, how do I do this part right here, you know, and separate tracks and everything. Um, but that's what I do right now. I do drum tracks for people. People will send me um, just music stems, all that kind of stuff. Oh, we need drums or our drummer wasn't doing it the right, what we wanted yeah. or the right tones and stuff. So I just re-record and everything. So uh, I do that. People get a hold of me on Instagram and that's what I do. Hell yeah, man. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing all, you know, sharing the dark times with us. And thank you for, for letting us know about your new project. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, I'll be sure to put a link to your Instagram in the show notes so everyone can check out your profile and uh, get in contact. So it's a pleasure, man. Kyle, I it's me, so man. good. I'm so glad we got to make this work because it was I know, so, so short notice and it worked out perfectly. So <laughs> it worked yeah, out great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right on, man. Well, thanks again. And, uh, everyone go check out Kyle and his project, Neon Coven. And uh, cheers. Thank you. Cheers, man.